Welcome to Unsafe Space. We have only two rules here. The first rule is feelings are not arguments. The second is no hitting. I'm your host, Carter Laren. So <clears throat> in the aftermath of the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, and it looks like he's going to be confirmed at this point, um, possibly not, but it looks like it. Uh, I'd like to talk to the survivors of sexual assault. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you about what happened during the hearings and really uh, more broadly about whether the Me Too movement is actually helping you and other victims or whether it's doing more harm than good. So, you know, l let me start by saying that, um, you know, you have my deepest sympathies. They, my, my sympathies go out to anyone who has ever experienced any kind of uh, sexual assault. Um, you know, what uh, was done to you was abhorrent and uh, unconscionable, and no one should ever have to, to suffer the way that you have. Um, you know, I know trauma like that can be very impactful on someone's life and uh, in the lives of those around you. And so my heart really, really does go out to you if you are a victim of, of sexual assault. Um, you know, I've helped friends deal with trauma like this before, and uh, it can be really, really, really difficult. Um, so now, not only do I care about you and what you've been through, uh, I think it is uh, crucially important that we build a culture in which sexual assault is not accepted and the perpetrators... Uh, receive justice. So let me just say that at the outset. <clears throat> so so let's talk about culture. If, if, like me, you care about sexual assault victims, um, the goal really should be to build a culture that, um, you know, in which legitimate actual victims uh, are believed and, and one in which perpetrators are brought to justice. So let's t take a look at the culture that surrounded the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, now to do that, let's assume that Dr. Ford is just telling the truth outright. I don't wanna <clears throat> uh, question that. Let's just assume that Dr. Ford is telling the truth. And we'll assume therefore that Brett Kavanaugh is guilty of the sexual assault uh, against her. And, um, and so with that premise, let's examine, if, if we assume that that's true, let's examine how, that, how things played out um, if, if those things are true and, and what effect that had, uh, the way the, the way hearings were held, what effect that had on, on justice for, for sexual uh, uh, assault victims. Now, <clears throat> let's look at how, how these allegations were brought to light. So her allegations were brought public first by, um, by Senator Feinstein, who was already uh, very publicly and vehemently opposed to Kavanaugh, right? And it's also important um, that to understand that um, Feinstein had a clear incentive to delay the confirmation as long as possible, even if she couldn't actually stop the confirmation. So this is a woman with a clear incentive to either stop or, or at least delay um, the confirmation. And so she's the one who brought these allegations out. Um, and they were brought to the attention of the public at the last moment, right? So after the hearings had been completed and it looked like Kavanaugh um, <clears throat> was going to be uh, confirmed. So efforts by Feinstein and her colleagues had failed at that point, And that's when the allegations came out. So, you know, the mere mention of these allegations, by the way, did cause an immediate delay in Kavanaugh's confirmation. So to an unbiased observer, again, try and put your unbiased observer hat on here, to an unbiased observer, that fact alone makes the motivation behind the accusations appear suspect. Doesn't mean they are, just makes them appear suspect because of the way they came to light. Now, that suspicion is compounded by the fact that Feinstein actually sat on these allegations for about a month and a half. Right? So instead of bringing them forward when she had them, she didn't mention them to anyone. She spoke to Kavanaugh while she knew about these accusations, never mentioned anything, never mentioned anything to any of her colleagues. So uh, regardless of, of whether Dr. Ford's allegations are true or not, to onlookers, there is already some reasonable suspicion 
that Feinstein is using these allegations as a tool in order to delay the Kavanaugh confirmation process. So that's the kind of the context here. <clears throat> Again, it doesn't say anything about whether the allegations are true or false. In fact, for this discussion, we're assuming they're true. So, <clears throat> you know, even so, even though this, uh, they were brought to light in a very suspicious manner, and it looked and smelled, you know, pretty convenient for the Democrats, um, the response by many reasonable people, <clears throat> including myself, was something along the lines of, well, maybe she's telling the truth, right? We don't know. Uh, it's an accusation that on the face of it isn't, you know, crazy. It could happen, right? It's plausible. Um, and the next question that we all kind of wanted to know, those of us who are <clears throat> not really on uh, on one side or another, the next question we really wanted to know was, well, is there any corroborating evidence here? I mean, it seems kind of plausible. What else you got? Because right now it's it's you know, basically your word. And, and remember, Kavanaugh denied it, right? So, you know, a reasonable person at that point, I think, was kind of saying, well, you know, we can feel for Dr. Ford, we can feel sympathy for her, but at the same time, we can't judge Brett Kavanaugh uh, based on the accusations alone yet until we find some more um, information. So that's the response I think we would expect from from reasonable people, and it's and it's really only the only proper response I, I believe. And and I, frankly, I think even Dr. Ford would expect that response, right? Um, because she time and time again in her testimony kind of said, "Well, I wish I could provide more information." She seemed to understand that more information uh, would be a reasonable request. And so so this response amounts to kind of well, let's withhold judgment for now. It's a serious accusation. So let's look a little bit deeper. <clears throat> but interestingly, that was not the response of the Me Too movement. Uh, instead of looking this, at this objectively, right, the Me Too celebrities like Alyssa Milano and um, m- many Democrats and other celebrities uh, immediately concluded that Dr. Ford was absolutely telling the truth and Kavanaugh was unequivocally guilty. They just accepted that. And uh, they tweeted using the kind of hashtag believe her or believe survivors or that kind of thing. And they said things like all women should always be believed, right? And they marched and they protested on this. They, they found him guilty uh, in their opinion without the need for any additional evidence. Um, they showed the world that they're not really about exposing and punishing sexual predators. They're really about punishing any man so long as... His politics uh, are politics that they dislike, and some woman is willing to claim that they're his victim. So whether Ford or not was an actual victim or not um, didn't really seem relevant to the Me Too movement. So not only that, um, as you know, over the, the coming days after the initial allegations, there were more and more outrageous claims about Kavanaugh <clears throat> that came out, and and many less credible claims. And the Me Tooers, again, piled on here, right? They they gleefully crucified Kavanaugh without any hesitation at all. Um, they called him a, you know, drunken gang rapist, right? And they destroyed his reputation um, as best they could. Now, the Me Too movement never stopped to ask whether there was any corroborating evidence for any of these. Um, and they really refused to even entertain the possibility that the allegations might be false. Right? You would be vilified if you said, well, I'm not sure I believe her. It was all about believe her, believe her, believe her. And so to third-party observers, there wasn't a lot to distinguish the Me Too movement from a lynch mob, because that's what it looked like. And so <clears throat> what happened as a result? So, so Me Too got in there, and this is what they did. And what happened as a result of that movement? And I'm using Me Too broadly. I, it's, I know it's not super organized, but I'm talking about a cultural movement. Well, what happened as a result was that there was backlash. Um, people who were previously willing to kind of remain calm and objective about this uh, suddenly rushed to Kavanaugh's defense. I felt the need to rush to his defense. And, and I don't really care one way or another about uh, Kavanaugh being the next Supreme Court justice. So, you know, when the, when the Me Tooers kind of made it clear to everyone that this wasn't about the truth of what happened, the Kavanaugh supporters responded by turning this into a partisan battle, right? They stopped caring. I'm talking about 
you know, the Kavanaugh supporters at this point. They stopped caring uh, whether any accusations were true or not, and they just rallied to beat the Democrats at all cost here. Um, they dismissed the idea of even subpoenaing Mark Judge, right? Um, they lectured and shamed the Democrats um, at, the, at the hearing on Thursday. Even Lindsey Graham grew a spine, which was shocking. Uh, and, you know, he angrily ranted about the farce that he perceived the Democrats had orchestrated. And, and ultimately, they pushed the committee vote through. And it doesn't look like anyone feels bad about it. It doesn't look like the Republicans are, you know, maybe Jeff Flake, but it doesn't look like many people are feeling bad about this. So <clears throat> why was all there this backlash? Let's examine the backlash for just a minute. Um, you can't just chalk it up to evil Republicans. Right? That, that's, um, you know, something really happened here. Lindsey Graham has never been that fired up. So what happened? Well, people saw the Me Too movement and what it represented in that moment and they felt threatened by it, right? And this is understandable because what the Me Too movement represented over the past week or two was an angry, irrational mob out for blood. Um, you know, they looked at Me Too and they saw a world in which their husbands, their brothers, their fathers, their sons, their male friends um, could have their lives utterly destroyed by this emotional tidal wave with no capacity for self-criticism. Um, and this was led by, you know, popular celebrities and influential politicians. These weren't fringe people. <clears throat> and, and they saw this world where these lives could be destroyed uh, as a result of nothing more than an accusation, no need for corroboration, no benefit of the doubt, no innocent until proven guilty assumptions, um, no questioning uh, the veracity of the victim's statements, not even a pretense of fairness right? Guilt, right? Immediate guilt and vilification and public lynching, basically, is what they saw. And in context, you got to look at this in context. This isn't new, right? The Me Too movement is, is more recent, but the ideology behind it isn't new. This didn't occur in a vacuum. Um, for decades, you know, we've watched as so-called, you know, progressives have infiltrated college campuses and replaced due process with rape tribunals, Right, in which you know, the accused has no right to face his accuser, uh, no right to legal representation. Uh, he's presumed guilty at the outset of, of the, the trial or the tribunal. Um, he's, so he's burdened with an often impossible task of proving his innocence. And, and he's punished and, and often kicked out of school and had other uh, repercussions <clears throat> without really a fair chance to defend himself. And so we've seen the press celebrate frauds, right? Like uh, Emma Sulkowitz, she was the girl that <clears throat> paraded around Columbia's campus with a mattress uh, to protest her rape, which it turns out never actually happened. She just made up. Um, and Crystal Gale Mangum, who uh, was the accuser in 2006 of the Duke Cross team, she accused them of, of gang raping her. Uh, again, you know, only after the lives of these accused men had been destroyed did we discover that she made everything up, <clears throat> right? And neither of those women, those are just two examples, there are more, but neither of those two women were punished for destroying the lives of innocent men. Uh, Crystal Gale Magnum actually uh, did end up going to uh, jail for second-degree murder, unrelated, later. Uh, so she turned out to be a real peach. But, <clears throat> but the women weren't uh, punished at all for lying and destroying the lives of these men. And so this culture of victim worship, of automatically assuming that anyone accused of, of sexual assault is guilty, is destroying and has been destroying the lives of innocent men. And it's an injustice to, to true victims of sexual assault because you know, it fails to distinguish between the unsubstantiated and potentially false allegations and credible ones that may be supported by corroborating evidence. So, you know, although the Me Too movement may have done some good by encouraging victims to step forward and expose predators, and, and we've seen some of that in the past year or so, uh, the way the movement responded to the allegations against Brett Kavanaugh was reckless and irresponsible and unjust. And people saw that. Uh, and they saw it in the context of this rising culture of victim worship. 
that's happened across campuses, in businesses, and elsewhere. And when people saw that, I think this ceased being about Kavanaugh versus Ford, right? It stopped being about the particulars of this case, and it started, you know, it started being about something else. Ford's Me Too zealots became this representation of all that's wrong with the culture of victim worship. People looked at them and they saw all the damage this ideology has done, continues to do, and will do in the future, right? And they didn't see a confirmation hearing. They saw a war, a cultural war, in which innocent men, again, their sons, husbands, fathers, would be sacrificed on an altar of blind belief in any accusation by any alleged victim. That's what they saw. And so, because they saw a war, they fought back, right? In, in a righteous fit of rage, they fought back. They started caring less about the truth and more about striking a blow, right? They wanted to strike a blow on this kind of elusive em enemy that's been corroding the concept of justice for decades, right? Eating away at the lives of innocent men like a cancer. And you can blame them for this. Right, for sure, you can blame them for losing sight of the particulars of the case and making it about this war. But the truth be told, the real blame lies in the, the culture of victim worshipers. If you're a victim of sexual assault, again, my heart goes out to you if you're a victim of sexual assault. Um, I want you to understand that a culture of victim worship doesn't do you any good. It encourages and rewards liars. The, the Me Too movement isn't helping you. Instead, they're making you indistinguishable from frauds. People can't tell the difference between your valid experience and frauds. And when you can't tell the difference between an actual victim and people like Crystal Gale Mangum, uh, people will stop believing accusers, right? They'll stop believing any accuser. And they'll stop caring because they'll assume that you're just another fake victim vampire, right? Out to destroy the life of an innocent man. And if you're a real victim, that's not true. That's not what you're about. So if you want to help build a culture where sexual assault is not tolerated and victims are given a, a fair hearing, you need to demand due process. You know, be happy that the accused should be innocent until proven guilty, right? Because that's the only way victims will ever be taken seriously. You know, most importantly, if you care, be a good friend, a good sibling, a good parent. Be good enough so that if someone you know is assaulted, they feel comfortable and supported enough, supportive enough, supported enough to come to you immediately, right, for, for help and support and care and justice. Be that friend, be that parent, so that they can come forward to you immediately. Because 35 years later, making a case is going to be a lot harder, and it should be. And without the emotional support in place at the time of an assault, a victim is going to quietly suffer in those intervening years, and perhaps for the rest of her life. Thanks for, for watching Unsafe Space. You can visit us at unsafeshow.com. We're also on Patreon at unsafe space, patreon.com slash unsafe space. You can follow us at unsafe show on Twitter. Uh, please like, subscribe, follow, and I will talk to you next time.